Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? You want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. It is September of 1939. The Germans are about to march into Poland, and you are standing in an English manor house with a complete list of Nazi agents in your possession. While facing you, guns drawn, are three people who, to get that list, would gladly kill you. Today, with Ben Wright starred as Sir Everard Dominey, we bring you an exciting story of super espionage as E. Phillips Oppenheim told it in his fascinating novel, The Great Impersonation. Incredible. Von Ragestein, this is incredible. He is drunk? Dead drunk. He is seldom otherwise. Uh, Hold the light closer to the cot so I can see him better. Uh, truly incredible, von Ragestein. You and he are as alike as... Well, I would swear it was you lying here on the cot. Yeah. Hair, nose, mouth, everything like a, a smudged and smeared portrait of yourself. Identical features. And we have the same color eyes, and there's not an inch of difference in our height. Where did you find him? Oh, he staggered into camp three days ago. He had been hunting lion upriver until his boys deserted him. He had not paid them in several months, I gather. I sent a runner to fetch you at once. That is something I shall have to report to Berlin as a serious breach of discipline von Ragestein. You were to avoid all contact with me except through the usual channels. But Dr. Schmidt, may I... Permit me to finish. Obedience to orders is as necessary in the secret service as it is in any other branch of the German army. I understand. I have spent 20 years here in Tanganyika, establishing myself as a harmless old archaeologist... During that time, I have created an espionage organization second to none, right under the noses of the English, and not once have they suspected me. Is all that to be ruined because you choose to engage in a little frolic of your own? This was not a frolic. Sir, I I, I weighed the risk very carefully and considered it worthwhile. I, I, I believe you will agree with me when I tell you that this man is Sir Everard Domini, an English baronet, and that we attended Oxford together. Shall I continue? Yes. Yes, continue, von Ragestein. He is a ne'er-do-well. He lives on a small sum that comes to him each month from his estate in Norfolk. He has been here in Africa almost as long as I. Eleven years. Oh, but I could go on for hours. I know as much about him as he does himself. And I've been thinking that... That you could go to England as Sir Everard Dominey and no one there would be the wiser. Dr. Schmidt, a German agent in England, operating at the highest social level... Would be invaluable, I agree, but... But what, sir? The proposal raises three questions in my mind. Ah, So? What about the assignment upon which you are engaged here? A certain flexibility is necessary in these matters. And how will Dr. Goebbels feel about your leaving Africa? Ach, surely by this time he has either forgiven me or forgotten the entire incident. <laughs> you don't know the little doctor if you think that. When someone steals away one of his women, as you did, uh, what was her name? Stephanie Strom. Yeah, yeah, as you did, Stephanie Strom. He never forgets and never forgives. But I will undertake the responsibility for initiating your plan. Prepare to leave for England at once. You will receive further orders before you embark. Thank you, sir. I must go now. There are many arrangements to be made. Sir, as you said that there were three questions raised in your mind. Hmm? Oh, yeah. I was wondering what to do with this Englishman. Kill him as soon as possible and dispose of his body. Good luck, von Ragestein. Heil Hitler. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Heil Hitler. That night, a new Sir Everard Domini was born, and Leopold Ragestein vanished from the face of the earth. Dr. Schmidt's arrangements were most thorough, and I arrived in London less than a month later. 
Uh, Mr. Mangan will see you now, sir. Well, thank you. My dear Sir Everard, a most unexpected pleasure. Most un... Oh, dear me, how changed you are and how well you look. Credit Africa, Mr. Mangan. A wonderful country. It's done wonders for you. Dear me. Uh, are, are you thinking of settling down here for a time? Well, that depends a little upon what you have to tell me. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, regarding the matter of Roger Unthank, nothing has been heard of him since the day you left England. His body has never been found. And uh, my wife? Her ladyship's condition is, I believe, unchanged. She is in excellent physical health, but mentally... She still swears to take my life if I ever I sleep under the same roof as she... Uh, well, I... I uh, see. She... Uh, I, uh, I may very likely settle down at Domine Hall. Oh, I'm afraid the estate is still not in very good condition. All those debts you left oh, yes. behind... Oh, quite, it. quite, yes. Uh, the business object of my visit to you is to ask you to make arrangements as quickly as possible for the paying off of the mortgages of the Domini estates. What? I, I've been making a good deal of money in Africa. Great Scott. A Domini making money. <laughs> in the 40 years I've managed the Domini interests, I've never known that to happen. <laughs> Dear, dear, I can hardly believe it. Well, have lunch with me, Mr. Mangan, and I'll tell you something of my speculations in Africa. Why, thank you, Sir Everard. Oh, uh, my knowledge of restaurants in London is a bit uh, dated. Uh, may I suggest the Carlton? Oh, excellent. <laughs> Give me your hat, Sir Everard. I shall check it. I'll be with you now. All right, I'll wait for you right here. Leopold, oh, Leopold, huh? why didn't you let me know you are in England? Ah, oh, Leopold, how happy I am I to think you're making a mistake. My name is not Leopold. <laughs> Darling, do you deny knowing me? Madam, I do not have the pleasure. Uh, my name is Domini, Everard Domini. I don't und Leopold, my address is 17 Belgrave Square. Come there at seven this evening. But, my dear I lady... I shall expect you at seven. Here we are. Seven sharp. Uh, dear me, Sir Everard, wasn't that Stephanie Stone? Well, I, I don't know. She mistook me for someone else. Oh, she's a marvellous actress. Marvellous. I saw her in Macbeth last month. And she, uh, a table for two? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this way, please. She played Lady Macbeth, you know. And in that scene... Oh, excuse me one moment, water. Mr. Mangan. Uh, Seaman! Seaman, my dear fellow, how are you? Well, Everard, what a surprise. <laughs> May I introduce my friend and legal advisor, Mr. Mangan? Uh, Mr. Mangan, Mr. Seaman. Uh, how do you it's a pleasure, do? Sir. Seaman and I were business associates in Africa. Uh? Will you join us at lunch, Seaman? Thank you, but I cannot. Uh, where are you staying, Everard? At my estate in Norfolk, near Flankmere. I, I, I'm driving there this evening. Why, um, I have to be in Norfolk on business tomorrow. Be my guest, will you? <laughs> Thank you, Everard. Thank you. Good day, Mr. Mangan. Uh, good day, sir. Now, uh, as I was saying, I... Uh, what was I saying? Uh, you were about to ask me if I cared for a drink, and I was about to say yes, a scotch and soda. Oh, yes. Uh, the same for me. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir Everard, do you think it wise to return to Domini Hall before uh, Lady Domini has been prepared for it? Mr. Mangan, does she really regard me still as the murderer of Roger Unthank? The mystery has never been solved. It's well known that you two fought that night and that you staggered home almost senseless. Roger Unthank has never been seen since. If I'd killed him, why wasn't his body found? Oh, there are many theories and quite a few superstitions. You may as well be prepared for one of them. There's not a soul for miles around Domini Hall who doesn't believe the ghost of Roger Unthank still haunts the Black Wood near where you fought. Oh, but that's incredible. Yes, yes, I would agree. Except that from time to time, it has been heard shrieking and sobbing. Oh, come Sir now, Everard, Maggot. Sir Everard, I have heard it myself. <laughs> Tired, Mr. Mangan? Uh, just a bit, but we shall be there in a few minutes. I telephoned before we left London, and they have rooms ready for us. Um, any of the old servants still left? Oh, none. Every servant and caretaker we've had there has given notice within a month. At least a dozen swore that they had seen the ghost of Roger Unthank and heard his call at night. 
That's the sole reason why I haven't recommended long ago that you should get rid of Mrs. Unthank. Oh, she is still in attendance upon Lady Domine? We couldn't get anyone else to stay there. And her ladyship absolutely declines to leave the hall. Uh, through that gate, Sir Everard. Yes, I remember. Oh, some of the old wall is down, I see. That wall has been down, to my knowledge, for 30 years. Of course. I'd forgotten. We've kept the old place weather tight, and I don't think you will miss the timber we were forced to sell. Oh, any from the black wood? Not a twig. Not one of the woodmen would ever go near the place. Well, you and I will take a look at the black wood in the morning. Well, if you insist, Sir Everard. How, how does it feel to be at home after all these years? I feel as though this is my first visit. Uh, oh, uh, good evening, Mrs. Unthank. There's no place in this house for you, Everard Dobney. No place here for a murderer. Oh, really, my good Can woman. Can you we... face me, Edward Dermony? You who murdered my son and made a madwoman of your wife. Mrs. Unthank, return to your duties at once and understand that this house is mine to enter or leave when I choose. And you will treat Sir Everard with respect. Have, have rooms been prepared for us? You will be in the West Wing, Mr. Mangan. And the Oak Room has been prepared for Sir Everard. You mentioned respect, Mr. Mangan. If he stays here against my bidding, perhaps her ladyship will show him what respect means. Good night. Oh, dear, dear, dear. My dear Sir Everard, I'm dreadfully sorry that oh, such Oh, that's a... quite all right. I... Quite all right. Well, I... Uh, I think I'll turn in immediately. Uh, we'll make the rounds of the estate after breakfast. Sir Everard, are you really going to sleep in the oak room? Yes. Why? Have you forgotten? It's next to her ladyship's. And... and... No, I have not forgotten. Good night, Mr. Mangan. I do not know how long I had been asleep when I felt the thin, cold pressure against my throat. I opened my eyes and I saw a hand, a small, slim hand in the moonlight just beneath my chin. If you move, you will die. Remain still. I wish to look at you. Rose. You are very brave to have come here. Braver than I remembered. Why do you wish to kill me? Doesn't it say somewhere, a life for a life? You killed Roger Unthink. Last night his spirit called to me below my window. No. No. Don't move. Let me look at you, my husband. It's a strange thing to own after all these years. A husband. What? What do you see? You're wonderfully changed. Better looking. I have changed, Rose. And I've come back a rich man. I shall bring some wonderful doctors here and they'll make you quite strong and well again. I've been wondering why I don't kill you, ever, as I've sworn to. I know now. I know why I don't. Why, Rose? Because I've just realized you aren't ever at all. Yes, that's why. You needn't fear ever that I shall kill you. Because you're not ever at all. I spent the most of the next day going over the estate with Mangan, and when he left for London in the afternoon, he carried with him my cheque for £90,000 to settle the mortgage on Domney. And soon after his departure, Seaman arrived. And it was very good of you to have invited me. Well, come into the library. Uh, how was your trip here? Oh, very pleasant. Very pleasant. The countryside is lovely this time of year, and, uh... How did it go, Leopold? Well, I think... Good. Mangan accepted me completely as ever our Domini. And if I say so myself, I think that I have made a very convincing transformation into an English country gentleman. Oh. Of course, it's been uncommonly expensive. Yeah. Every penny you gave me when we met at Cape Town is gone to pay off the mortgage of Sir Everard's... Oh, 
<laughs> Excuse me. On my estate. Well, we could not have you return home to a poverty-stricken domain. You'd have held no place whatsoever in English social life and no welcome from those with whom we desired you to stand well. Now, there is no bottom to our purse in these matters and more will be deposited to your account. Ah, from my African investments? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, from your African investments. So... All has gone smoothly? Yeah, yeah, all Good. except for one thing. Oh? Uh, Stephanie Strom met me by chance in a restaurant yesterday. She recognized me at once, of course, and seemed quite piqued when I denied knowing her. She demanded I called upon her at her home yesterday evening. Well? Has it occurred to you that she has claims upon Leopold von Ragerstein which would altogether interfere with the career of Everard Domini? Our relationship before I left Germany was fairly well known. And if we are seen together now, someone might put two and two together and... Yeah, 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 you're right, of course. I'll see what I can do. It will not be easy. Stephanie is extremely strong-willed and impetuous. She will do as she is told. See? Anything else? No. Good. Now listen very carefully. I have instructions for you. I am listening. We move upon Poland in September. Now, if England declares war, it will, of course... Render espionage work here extremely difficult in two major respects. Yeah, one, one, the English will redouble security precautions, mm. and two, it will be almost impossible to bring in money with which to pay our agents in this country. It is with the second difficulty that you will be concerned. Your function will be that of paymaster. Go on. Now, from now until September, three million pounds will be given to you. Ah. To whom do I disperse this money? Ah, the day we begin to conquer Poland... Written instructions together with a list of all our agents here and in Ireland will be placed in your hands. Understood. So until then, live the life of Sir Everard Domini Baronet. So, I will visit you from time to time to keep you abreast of events. So goodbye for the present, Leopold. I have a million things to do. Oh, and uh, good luck in your impersonation. Thank you. I think I shall need it. In just a moment, we will return to escape. But first, May 16th, we'll see the opening of the United States Treasury's Opportunity Drive, a drive to acquaint all those Americans who aren't already saving via U.S. savings bonds with the opportunities they are missing. Men and women who know through experience the many merits of this kind of saving are urged to become volunteer salesmen for the U.S. Treasury. If you would like to help sell American Opportunity, get in touch with your county savings bond chairman right away. And now with our star, Ben Wright, as von Ragestein and Sir Everard Domini, we return to the second act of Escape and The Great Impersonation. I followed Seaman's instructions to the letter and pursued exactly the course I thought Sir Everard Domini himself would be likely to take. I put Lady Domini in the hands of a Dr. Harrison, a psychiatrist. I pensioned Mrs. Unthank off, but to my surprise, she remained in the vicinity. I began to entertain upon a lavish scale, shooting parties, hunts, dinners, and dances. Unavoidably, Stephanie appeared among my guests from time to time. It was evident from her manner that Simon had spoken to her concerning me, and quite forcibly. It was also evident that she did not like it. I could see her patience wearing thinner and thinner. And one Friday to Monday, as I was walking through the garden after breakfast... I wish to speak to you alone. Well, my guests will be... Your uh... guests are well occupied. And in any case, I'm one of them. What is it, Stephanie? Leopold. Can it be you've lost your love for me? You've changed so much and in so many ways. Stephanie... I thought it had been impressed upon you. I am not Leopold, but Everard Domini, an Englishman and the owner of this house and the husband of Lady Domini. I can almost believe you are an Englishman. You stand there cold and aloof as one. You whose tears have fallen upon my hand, whose lips... You speak of one who is dead. What has changed you like this? What has dried up all the passion in you. Careful, Stephanie. Someone is coming. Yes, what is it, Parkins? Big pardon, sir, but Lady Domini has returned. Oh, thank you, Parkins. Uh, Stephanie, will you excuse me? Leopold, something has just occurred to me and I shall not see you, or rather trouble you for a while. 
I'm going to take a sea voyage. A sea voyage? Where? To Africa, Leopold. To Africa. May I see my wife, Dr. Harrison? This evening, perhaps. It's been a fatiguing journey for her, and I would prefer her to rest as much as possible. How is she? Well, except for one hallucination, she's in perfect health. And this one hallucination? That you're not her husband. It's not within my power to dispel this hallucination. You are the one to do it. That's why I brought her home. What can I do, Doctor? She needs warmth and affection, Everard. I see. I, I'm very grateful to you, Doctor. I... I shall do everything I can to complete her recovery. Thank you. Yes? It's I, Rose. May I come in? Yes, Edward. Rose, I... I couldn't go to sleep before welcoming you home. Thank you, Everett, dear. That makes me very happy. You're looking well and extremely lovely. I am well. All the foolishness is gone. I know that whatever happened to poor Roger it was not you who killed him. I know that I never really heard his ghost call to me. It, it was my imagination. I can't think why I ever wanted to hurt you. I'm sure I love you. Then why do you doubt that I am your husband? So like me, yet so unlike him. He's dead, he died in Africa. Then who am I, Rose? I don't know. But you're kind to me. And when you're near, I'm happy. Rose, look at me. I am Everard. I am. Can't you see? <gasps> it's Roger. He's calling me. What? Everett, I do hear it, don't I? It's not just in my head. Rose. Let me go. I must wave to him from the window. He never rests until I wave to him from the window. Please, I Rose, can't do Rose, that. if you love me, do one great favor for me. Do not go to the window. Don't no, wave. I must wave. I can't stand his cry. It Rose, does. as you love me, please. Oh. All right, Everett. I'll do as you say, but hurry, hurry, please, hurry. I ran out of her suite and down the stairs. Parkins was standing in the entrance to Dominey Hall, a heavy walking stick in his hand. I told him to follow me, and we hurried through the garden. And there, beneath Rose's window, I saw a dark shape. Slowly now, Parkins. <laughs> Slowly and quietly. <gasps> ah! Parkins! Parkins, help me! Come on, your stick! Oh, well... Well done, Parkins. And do you have a match? Uh, yes, sir. Well, strike it, man. Strike it. Oh, very good, sir. All right. Take a look. And who is it? It's... It's Roger Unthank. Ah. Telephone the hospital in Plankney to send an ambulance for him at once. Roger. Right. Roger! Oh, you've... You've killed him. You've killed my son. He's not dead, Mrs. Unthank. Oh, though he deserves to be. Soul. His jealousy drove him mad. If now Lady Dominie recovers, I will forgive both you and your son for this revolting hoax. If she does not, I wish you both the blackest corner of hell. Rose had received a great shock that night. But as the summer wore on, she began to mend, and Dr. Harrison told me toward the end of August that he had every hope for her complete recovery. Meanwhile, the drift toward war quickened, and on the morning of the 1st of September, the German army smashed its way across the border into Poland. Simon telephoned me that morning to inform me that he would be at Dominey Hall that evening for a business conference, and about nine o'clock, he arrived. Mr. Seaman is here, sir. Thank you, Parkins. Oh, hello, Seaman. Oh, have you heard the terrible news, Sir Everard? Have you heard the wonderful news, Leopold? Our army is simply leaping ahead. I know. I have been listening to the wireless. We have to work quickly, very quickly. I must be in Ireland by tomorrow morning. Here, take these. What is it? These are microfilms, no larger than postage stamps. Ah. They contain your orders and the list of all our agents in these islands. Uh -huh. Now, Leopold, 
The fate of our espionage service here is now in your hands. Yeah, I understand. Good. And speaking of precaution, yeah? as you stooped to sit down just now, I distinctly saw the shape of your revolver in your hip pocket. Oh? Do you think it is wise to be carrying firearms about just oh, now? Oh, yeah, yeah, quite right. Here, here, take care of it for oh. me. <laughs> quick, quick, get the films out of sight. Into this drawer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes? What is it? Sorry to disturb you, sir, but Miss Strom is here and she And is... insist upon seeing you. Uh, Stephanie! Uh, thank you, Parkins. That will be all. Yes, sir. Stephanie, I did not know you had returned from <laughs> Africa. This afternoon, and I brought a visitor with me. Now tell me, Dr. Schmidt, who is this man? Leopold or the Englishman? Why, he is... Uh, he is the Englishman. <laughs> the Englishman. What have you done with Leopold? What have you done with him? He met with the fate he'd prepared for me. His body sleeps on the bed of the Rumor River. Well, uh, I uh, don't understand. You came to me at Cape Town. You had all von Hagerstein's letters. You know his history. We exchanged the most intimate confidences in his camp. The letters and papers I took from him. And, and, and the money, the three million pounds? If the German Secret Service wishes to formulate a claim and sue us. What are you? You two lumps of earth clods. You let this Englishman stand oh, and you... T- the lists. He has the lists of agents. Yes, and they should prove of great interest to His Majesty's government. Do something. We are three against one. Seaman. Back, uh, doctor, uh, not another step or I'll shoot. Seaman, get, grab him. Get back, Seaman. No, no, no. No, no, don't, don't shoot. Don't, don't shoot. No, no, Parkins. Parkins. Please, don't, don't shoot. Don't shoot. Yes, don't shoot. Rod. Telephone okay. the military barracks uh, at Norwich. Ask them to send a car and a strong escort immediately. Yes, sir. And then, uh, uh, Parkins, uh, come back here and see what uh, my guests will have. We're going now, Sir Rod. How is she? She's well. She's entirely well. See for yourself. Everard. Oh, Rose, my darling. Oh, my dearest. There were times when I couldn't believe you were my Everard. And now... Now? Now I know. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today we have presented Transcribed, The Great Impersonation by E. Phillips Oppenheim, adapted for radio by Walter Newman, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel. Starred as Sir Everard Dominey was Ben Wright, with Gene Bates, John Daner, Gabriel Windsor, Ted Von Eltz, Edgar Barrier, Ann Morrison, Parley Bear, and Ramsey Hill. Special music was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmar. Next week, at the same time, you will hear Tell It Again, bringing you the great stories you all remember. Be sure to listen again next week when we... Tell it again. It's Sunday night, and you think the troubles of the week lie ahead of you, but your troubles are nothing compared to the risks and hazards of running a general store as Lum and Abner run their Jotham Down Emporium in Pine Ridge, Arkansas. Your troubles of business and your troubles in love dissolve like bubbles when Amos and Andy encounter the kingfish and his latest gold bricks. Your troubles of trying to make good in the social world, in the worlds of music, sport, and fashion, of just trying to make good, vanish like a dream once you've heard Jack Benny. Amos and Andy and Lum and Abner are heard on most of these same CBS stations. Jack Benny is heard on them all. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now stay tuned for five minutes of the latest news and Let's Pretend, which follow over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.